Aldo! Welcome back, everybody. So, Lost Levels. You all know the story. It was originally released in Japan for the Famicom Disk System in June of 1986 to give masters of the original Super Mario Brothers something to make them regret their very existence. It was marketed as being a harder version of the first game, but when it came over to the States, Americans looked at it and went, Aww. And cancelled the Western release, holding it off until Super Mario All-Stars came out seven years later when it was given the Lost Levels moniker we know today. I first reviewed this game in a video I made over six years ago, and I don't really think very highly of it. Not the game itself. Well, yeah, that too. I'm talking about how I made the video. I put reviewed in brackets because I didn't even play Lost Levels for me to actually review it. I just wrote the script based on what I remembered it being like and used footage from Some Call Me Johnny's video. So even though I don't like the game all that much, I still think I should have done it better justice. But we've got a lot on our plate today because in this episode of Super Smash 3DS Revisited, we're not just talking about the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2, we're also going to be looking at the American Super Mario Bros. 2, and even the game it was based on, Doki Doki Panic. After all, I'm going to need something good to wash down the taste of this game. So right off the bat, you'll notice there's an option for you to play the entire game as either Mario or Luigi. Now, unlike the first game, where Luigi served as the Player 2 character and was nothing more than a palette swap for Mario, he's still pretty much a palette swap here, but at least he controls differently. Mario plays about the same as before, while Luigi, for the first time, has his signature higher jump and loafers with banana peels stitched into the soles. Lost Levels might have been the first to carry the title of Super Mario Bros. 2, but to me it feels more like an officially licensed ROM hack than a true sequel to the original game. The music is all the same, except for the extended version of the song that plays when you rescue Princess Peach, and there's also a new sound effect that plays when your character skids across the ground. Graphically, it's similar to the first game, but with a few minor changes. The text has an added drop shadow, which makes it easier to read. The ground is more detailed, clouds and hills have faces, and for another series first, the Super Mushroom has eyes. Cool. cool. Oh, look! That mushroom is a different color. I'm going to pretend I have no idea what it does and see what happens if I touch it. What? I died? Yeah, this game, rather infamously, also introduced the Poison Mushroom, which is really less of a power-up and more of a power-down. <laughs> God, that was terrible. Touching it as Super or Fire Mario will turn you back into Small Mario, and touching it as Small Mario kills you. So, needless to say... Don't touch it. And that's all I have to talk about in terms of gameplay. You can see why my original video was so short, because, like I said before, Lost Levels is basically a ROM hack of the first Super Mario Bros., so I can't really say much else about this game without repeating everything I mentioned in my revisiting of the last one. Except that the level design has seen a significant downgrade. Difficulty doesn't always have to determine the quality of a game, it all depends on how it's implemented and what the game is asking of the player. You have games like Mega Man that can be tough, but reasonable. And then you have games like Ghosts and Goblins that are about as forgiving as Statler and Waldorf judging a middle school talent show. They don't care who steps onto that stage, they just want to make your life a living hell. With Lost Levels, there were times where I thought to myself, no, oh, this, this seems pretty alright. And then the game had to remind me, oh yeah, I'm playing the Lost Levels, it's supposed to be worse. And you know, for a game that's meant to be more challenging than its predecessor, Lost Levels isn't really all that hard. Just bland and needlessly annoying. I played this on an emulator, so I apologize if you notice any rewinding or loading save states in the footage. But frankly, I didn't care how it was going to look in the finished video because in the moment, I just couldn't be bothered to deal with some of this stuff. 
there are levels that have some extremely cheap design elements, levels that require you to be super precise with your jumps, levels with warp zones that send you back to worlds you've already gone through, and levels that need to be beaten in very specific ways. World 8-2 ends with a warp pipe that takes you back to the midpoint with no real end in sight, so how do you get through it? Just jump off this paratroopa, hit this block to make a vine come out, climb up the vine, go to this cloudy area, and keep moving forward until you reach the flagpole. How is anyone supposed to know to do that without a map or a walkthrough telling them to? And that's another thing. This game loves maze levels, the kind where the stage keeps repeating if you don't take a specific route. The first game had some of these too, but the solutions were much simpler to figure out. This one just gets ridiculous with the maze levels. It's like even when you're taking the correct path, moving just one or two pixels one way will screw everything up, and then you have to do that section again. You have to get these patterns down damn near perfectly sometimes, but good luck trying to do that when they start throwing those super precise jumps into the mix. Ugh. Maybe it wasn't fair of me to call this game a ROM hack, because frankly, that would be an insult to ROM hacks. Well, what if I told you there were other worlds for you to unlock? Really, Mr. Echoey Disembodied Voice? Tell me more. You can unlock World 9 by defeating all the Bowsers at the end of Worlds 1 through 8 without using Warp Zones. And then there's World A, World B, World C, and World D. And how do you get to those worlds? You have to beat the game eight times in a row! No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. 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 Hell no. 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 I refuse. No. No. Yep, let's move on to the next game. So, as I'm sure most of you know already, the actual Super Mario Bros. 2 that we got in the US is actually a reskin of a game released in Japan called Yume Kojo Doki Doki Panic or Dream Factory Heart Pounding Panic. It started out as a prototype developed by Shigeru Miyamoto and Kensuke Tanabe for a game that utilized both vertical and horizontal scrolling. Yume Kojo in the final game's title refers to Yume Kojo 87, an event that took place in Japan during the summer of 1987. And somehow the bite of 87 doesn't tie into any of this at all. Fuji Television, Yume Kojo's sponsor, struck a deal with Nintendo to produce a game that would help promote the event, and thus, Doki Doki Panic was born. I've known the story of how this game was turned into Mario 2 USA for a number of years, but up until now, I've never actually gotten around to playing it, so I figured I'd throw this in just for fun. I won't spend too much time on the game here, so let's just take a look and see how it differs from its Mario-themed counterpart. Well, first off, the game opens with two kids getting pulled into a storybook, presumably by Wart, judging from the green hand, and shows our heroes quickly jumping in after to rescue them. Then you make it to the first level, and... Yep, I've definitely played something like this before. It's not exactly one-to-one, -one, of course. We have genie lamps instead of magic potions, and creepy-looking heads instead of Koopa shells. The exit door looks like a wrestler's mask, Every time a bad guy gets killed, it sounds like someone throwing up. And even the overworld theme is missing a couple of bars. What? Where's my music? Uh. Then we have our main characters. Imagine, Lena, Papa, and... MAMA! These guys were created specifically for the Yume Kojo event, and they each have their own unique abilities. Imajin's the most balanced, Lena can float in midair, Papa's the strongest and the fastest, and Mama has the highest jumps. Actually, speaking of controls, I think something's wrong with my controller because I'm holding the run button and it doesn't seem to be working. Hold up. This game doesn't even have a run button, does it? Nope. You can hold that B button down all you want, but the characters will still move slower than the time it's taking Capcom to make a new Power Stone game. Oh god. Oh, I farted and it smells awful. Something else I noticed is that you don't get to switch to a different character after finishing a level. You only get the option to do so after every world. And while each character goes through the same levels, 
It's not all at the same pace. Once you get to a certain point with one character, you'll have to replay earlier levels with whichever characters you didn't play with before. When I started the game, I got through all of World 1 using Imajin, but I can't pick any of the other guys to play through World 2 with because they're all stuck at World 1. <laughs> well, my schedule's already tight enough as it is, so why don't we just skip ahead to the Mario clone? One night, Mario finds a magic door in his dreams that takes him to the world of Subcon. The people of this world inform him that a giant frog named Wart has taken it over. Coincidentally, Mario's friends also had the exact same dream, and the next day, that dream ends up coming true as they find another magic door in a nearby cave, taking them back to Subcon. So, did the people of this world implant the dreams of our heroes into their heads to show them visions of the future? Is there some kind of Inception-level conspiracy taking place here? Nah, the whole game is just a dream. We all know this by now. Uh, we know this. Regardless, Wart's the bad guy, he has a bunch of cronies, he looks like Kermit the Frog's racist uncle, and you gotta stop them. Huh, I just made two Muppet references in one video. Not bad. With this game being a modified version of Doki Doki Panic, which already had some Mario things like PAL blocks and Starmen, many other aspects of the original were replaced with more recognizable, or at the very least, Mario-like elements. The most obvious being the characters you play as. Imajin is swapped out for Mario, Papa, despite bearing more of a resemblance to Mario, was turned into Toad, Lena is now Princess Peach, and Mama... <laughs> And Mama was <laughs> And Mama was changed to Luigi. Oh god, this is too perfect. Mama? Mama Luigi? <laughs> but the Mario theming also comes with some added enhancements. They actually included a run button this time, thank you. You can switch characters after beating each level. They don't have their own separate paths anymore. And with Claw Glip, the Mistchland's Ration, acting as the final boss of World 5, you only fight Mouser twice now instead of three times, making it 33.3% .3 less likely for you to have a seizure by the end of the game. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's reel it back a bit. There are seven worlds in total with three levels each, apart from World 7. Every stage has you moving left and right, or up and down, to get to the boss, kill them, grab the magic ball, walk into this giant bird head's mouth, and move on to the next level. In case it wasn't obvious already, this isn't your typical Mario adventure, and not just because it wasn't meant to be a Mario game in the first place. For one thing, killing enemies isn't a matter of simply jumping on their heads anymore. It's about tossing vegetables and Koopa shells at them, or picking them up and throwing them at other enemies. Or just watching them die of inexplicable causes. You also don't hate hate tits. Oh god, no. You also don't take hits in the same way as before, because now characters actually have a health meter visible in the upper left corner. Getting hit once makes you smaller, and getting hit again causes you to lose a life. But you can replenish your health after killing a certain number of bad guys, which causes a heart to float up from the bottom of the screen. Admittedly, it's not super practical, and there were a number of times where hearts would appear in places that made it impossible for me to reach them. Or this one instance in World 4-1 where the heart showed up right after I just lost a life. Perfect timing. But if you're worried about being too vulnerable, there is a way for you to be able to take some extra hits. Dropping magic potions will cause a door to appear, and going through it will take you to subspace. Not that one where you can find a super mushroom. Picking one up adds another point to your health meter and refills any health you lost. Yeah, as you can tell, collecting power-ups is also a bit of a departure from how it worked in the first Super Mario Bros., and that goes for the Starman, too. You see these cherries? Well, they're not just for putting on top of Sundays. Every stage has you collecting them, and grabbing five cherries will make a Starman appear, which once again makes you invincible, but for noticeably less time than in Mario 1. That doesn't bother me, though. It's not like the enemies you face are all that threatening to begin with. A few of them can be a little cumbersome, like Sniffits and Cobrats and Panzers, oh my. But that's more based on how many are on screen and where they're placed. And at least these three can shoot things out of their mouths, or heads, or whatever, making them less easy to avoid. The rest of Wart's minions just move around or don't even move at all. 
Part of what makes Mario level design fun is the variety of obstacles you have to face, and a lot of that comes from the enemies and all their different means of attacking. Needing to be quick to dodge things like a Hammer Brothers hammer, or using enemy attack patterns to your advantage, like jumping off of a bullet build to reach higher platforms. And on the platforming side, I think Mario 2 is more engaging than the first game. Some levels can be a bit of a drag, and others like World 7-2 especially feel bloated. But there are more areas to explore, more secrets to uncover, the screen can actually move to the left now, and the vertical sections keep things from getting too stale. But where this game excels in creative platforming, it kind of falls flat in the enemy department, because a majority of these foes don't put up much of a fight, and the only sort of challenge they can give you mostly depends on where they are and not what they can do. What does it mean when a gender-confused dinosaur that shoots eggs out of its nose is somehow more threatening than a literal walking bomb? It means I should probably talk about the bosses, shouldn't I? Yeah, I might as well. So, every stage in every world ends with a boss fight. The first two end with a fight against variations of Birdo, and the third one has you fighting someone different. Mouser throws bombs that you have to toss back at him, Triclyde is a three-headed snake that shoots fireballs at its mouths. Fry Guy moves around and requires you to drop blocks on its head until it splits up into smaller Fry Guys, which are kind of annoying to deal with, but shouldn't be too hard to kill. And this- Oh man, they even made the exit door a boss. Is there anything in this game that isn't trying to get you? I'm fighting an exit! That time I actually was trying to sound like Jaden Yuki. Ironically, the least interesting of the bunch is the big bad amphibian himself, Wart. This machine spits out veggies, veggies, and nothing but veggies, and all you have to do is throw them into Wart's mouth. Since he apparently has no understanding of the concept of chewing, he'll swallow them whole and choke on them until he's eventually defeated. Then the people of Subcon are freed, we see them carrying Wart's body off screen for them to do something to it, and then the game ends. So, overall, what's my new verdict on Super Mario Bros. 2? Well, in my original video, I said that it was good, but a little hard to comprehend. And <laughs> I have absolutely no idea why I said that. I think even back then I liked the game just fine, so maybe I was trying to sound smart or make my opinions sound more sophisticated? <laughs> Well, that definitely backfired. I was just being a dummy. I mean, this game is just fun. I, I don't see what's so hard to comprehend about it. The characters are all fun to play as. The levels are all fun to explore. The soundtrack is incredibly bouncy and fun to listen to. That's the key word here. Fun. My only problems with the game stem from its roster of enemies. If they posed more of a threat and presented more variety in how they behaved, I think it would have made the level design just a little bit stronger. But I still found this game very enjoyable to play, just as much as the first one. And even if there are people who might not consider this to be the real Super Mario Bros. 2, you can't ignore the lasting impact it left on the Mario franchise going forward. Enemies like Shy Guys and bob would become series staples, Birdo would occasionally pop up in a few spin-offs here and there, the concept of a health meter would later be utilized in most of Mario's 3D games, Luigi having the highest jumps and Peach being able to float became trademarks of their characters, even plucking vegetables out of the ground was incorporated into Peach's moveset for Super Smash Bros. So while the game's roots might not have been directly tied to Mario, it certainly helped shape his world into what we know today, and you gotta give it credit for that. Now this would have been the part where I tell you to look forward to the Super Mario Bros. 3 revisiting, since that's the game I initially reviewed after Mario 2, but I think I might just change up the order for this series. Originally I looked at the classic 2D games first, then the Mario Land games, then the new Super Mario Bros. games, and then the 3D games. It seemed to work pretty well for me, but some people were confused as to why I didn't review them in the order they were released in. So. Let me know what you think. Should I take a chronological approach to this series and look at Super Mario Land for the Game Boy next time? Or should I just stick with the pattern of my older videos and move on to Super Mario Bros. 3? And I know Mario 3 technically came out before Mario Land in Japan, but I'm going by US releases, so shove off. But anyway, shout your thoughts in the comments down there, and I'll probably put a poll up on my community tab as well, so have at it. And until next time, this is Mark, 
formerly Super Smash 3DS, bidding you all a smashing farewell. Oh, just kidding, we're not quite done yet. Before I go for real, I'd just like to say thanks for watching, and as always, I'd like to give a very special thanks to my superstar supporters for this month, Red Rack, Sun Blue Miri, Henry Newman, Anna Robbins, and Jake Winans. If you'd like to support me as well, then please consider pledging to my Patreon page, or becoming a sponsor by clicking the Join button. Membership options give you the same benefits as my Patreon, including being able to watch videos before they come out, getting access to exclusive content, and getting shoutouts at the end of my videos. But during live streams, you'll also get one of these special badges next to your name and post these special emojis in the chat. Both my Patreon and YouTube membership are totally optional. I won't force you to look into them if you don't want to, but it would just mean a lot to me if you gave them a look, and it would really support the channel in a big way. And I don't really have any other updates to give, so I'll just go ahead and wrap things up. Links to my social media and Discord server are in the description, and if you want to stay updated on my future uploads, then be sure to ring that bell. Thanks again for watching, and I already did the outro, didn't I? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Take care, everybody.